Good day to you people of the internet. So today I have a Wells Garner V1002 CRT chassis. Uh, this belongs to a Space Invaders Deluxe cabinet that I'm currently restoring. And since this unit is, you know, 40 years or better old, I figured a good place to start would be recapping everything and giving it a once-over before we even apply power to it. So I was able to find a company called ArcadePartsAndRepair.com that makes recap kits such as this Mega Deluxe Cap Kit for the V1000 series chassis. Now according to their documentation, uh, this does cover the 1001, 1002, 1003, and the 22 inch 1000 series chassis. So there's some things we're going to do in addition to changing the caps. Obviously we're going to want to clean everything up, check diodes, potentially reflow um, these connections and supply wires. We're going to have to look into um, trying to fix this flyback transformer as well as cleaning out the little diode socket here, making sure our transistors aren't grounded. And I figured I'd make a breakout video um, and just kind of video the process so people can see it if they're interested. Now what's nice about this chassis is I can turn these little clips here and this board will literally, literally come up off the chassis and be released by these pins. Um, let's see if I can kind of just show you guys a little bit here. So it comes up real nice with just a little bit of pressure. Uh, we gotta clamp these plastic releases in though. And we wanna do it gentle um, because we don't wanna break any of the traces in the process. So I'm gonna pull this board out I'm going to give it a good cleaning, uh, and then I'll come back and we'll start the recapping process. Pretty happy with how this board cleaned up. Let's move over to capacitors. Now the documentation that came with this kit calls out the capacitor number and the value. Uh, this is a good reference point during the install. It also lets us know that we have some options here depending on what version of the board we have. Uh, again, we have the 1002. So it's telling us that certain boards might have a different capacitor in this slot. For example, C219 could be 150 microfarad or 220. Ours is the 150. It also lets you know of a change that they made if a part is no longer available. So let's start replacing some caps. We'll begin with the big one here, uh, C234, which according to the documentation has been upgraded to a 330 microfarad cap at 100 volts. So when removing a component, I always like to add a little bit of fresh solder. Now I am using just a, um, a rosin core here. 6644 blend. All right, with a little new solder added, now we put some heat on it so it can flow down. I'm going to use a little thing here called a solder pult, and we'll uh, see if we can clear those holes. You want to make sure that your polarities line up. This one is positive to negative. Negative on this cap is uh, donated by this white stripe here. I'm not pushing it completely flush against the board, giving it just a tiny bit of breathing room underneath. We'll bend the leads out to hold. and clip the leads off. All right, let's speed things up.
That looks great. Everything's been recapped, reflowed. Um, all these potential places that things could move and get a cold solder joint have been redone. Um, but because we used rosin core solder, we don't want to leave any of that rosin on the board um, to eventually eat through traces. Uh, so I just use a little bit of isopropyl alcohol. And clean it down with a soft wire brush. Right, we can see we're picking up quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of that stuff. So I think I'm going to rinse it just a little bit more with this alcohol closer to the sink. Be right back. Now that we've got all the resin cleaned off, let's give it one last inspection to make sure that we didn't um, bridge any solder joints, um, put anything in backwards. Back to the chassis, uh, flipped over on the back here. This is the last capacitor that we need to replace from our kit. Uh, now this chassis uses something called wire wrapping. That's where they take the lead and kind of spin it around a post and then add a bunch of solder to it. So I think the easiest way to get this out for us um, is gonna be to just clip the leads and then try to add some heat to the post and unwind it manually. We'll see how we do. Well, I'm worried about applying too much heat and melting the plastic that these uh, posts are sitting in. So perhaps we'll just clip it as close as we can. And uh, just rewrap it. Alright, so just confirming this is the 160 volt, 33 microfarad. Now that we got our cap kit installed, let's go ahead and check some diodes around the board to make sure that they're working well. You can do this by uh, getting your multimeter and setting it to the diode setting. Now on your diodes, we'll take this one here for example. The little stripe is called the cathode end and the other side is the anode. So we're going to take our negative lead and put it on the cathode and we'll take our positive lead and put it on the anode. We can see voltage passing through. Now if we flip them around, we should see no voltage passing through. So this diode's working great. I'm going to go through and uh, test the rest of them on the board real quick. Okay, so all of our diodes tested good. About the only thing still standing out to me is this uh, 100 volt 10 microfarad uh, electrolytic here. Um, it's part of the flyback transformer, and that uh, capacitor was not included in the kit. Uh, so I may order that one on my own. So now I'm going to go ahead and clean up these posts really quick. And we'll remount our board. Okay. So the board will just slide on over these posts, but when we originally had this board mounted, we had a bit of sag here in the middle, and you might be able to pick up that little bit of bow on camera. So I'm just going to clean up a nice spot on the chassis here, and I'm just going to place a little rubber bumper. give our board something to sit on. So next up is going to be kind of looking at this flyback transformer. Now this is the anode cup um, that clicks to the CRT itself and right here in this boot is a high voltage diode. Now this diode uh, these two boots have a little spring in it, and the diode's supposed to have this tiny little uh, lead sticking out that makes contact with the springs inside this boot and passes the uh, voltage along to the tube. Well, unfortunately, 
while I was cleaning out some of the old crud, uh, which I'm sure was some kind of 1970s or 80s dielectric grease, I noticed that um, the pin on this side is completely missing. Uh, so that's going to be a pretty big deal breaker. We're going to have to source a new one of these. Now they don't make these kind of diodes anymore. I don't even think that they make uh, direct replacements for these kind of diodes anymore. So we're going to have to find uh, some gently used or or new old stock to get this going. Next thing to tackle I think is the brake here on this flyback. <clears throat> so I'm going to toss around a couple ideas trying to build a support out of uh, you know plastic putty or zip tying something but it doesn't really have to be here per se. So I think what I might do is super glue this here, clamp it overnight just to make it stable. And then I'll wrap it with um, like some plastic putty or something like that to give it some stability. Let's see how this works out. After letting the glue dry, I mixed up some two part plastic putty and really reinforced the section that the flyback diode sits into. I want to make sure that uh, you know it'll hold up to the test of time much better than just a little super glue will. Uh, so while I wait for that to dry, about the last thing I can think of that I need to do is address this diode. So I'm wondering if I can just cut away part of the top of the diode exposing just a little bit of lead, throw some flux on there and just Put a solder ball. Um, that would give me the connection I would need and I really wouldn't have to dig into this too much. So I got a couple ideas kicking around in my head. Um, I'm gonna go give this a shot and we'll see what we do. So I ended up going to a bench grinder and getting about three quarters of the way down to the lead and then just worked the rest of it by hand with a little file. Cleaning it with alcohol every once in a while just to see what I was working with. And then I got down to real close to the wire. I kind of chipped the rest of it away with a blade. So I didn't want to damage that wire too much. And I think it came out pretty good. So the plan, I guess, at this point, since I exposed so much lead, is to just try to bend it over like this one is. And uh, hopefully this is good to go. All right, with the board recapped, this diode repaired, everything cleaned, I was just about ready to get this into the chassis when it kind of stands out that this transistor is quite a bit newer looking than this older transistor. Now both of them have tested fine, but I just wanted to confirm this is the right one for the spot. So if we look back into the manual, this position right next to the can, see if we can get it on camera, is Q transistor Q101 and uh, regulates the 73 volts that this unit uses. So we go back to the parts section at the end of the manual. We can look up Q101, and we see that this is an NPN style transistor uh, that is a 2N5632. Uh, now I looked up the data sheet on this one. This is the BDW51C, and the data sheet seems pretty similar. Um, but the values on this are a little bit lower than the 2M. So I went over to kind of like a cross-reference page, and I didn't see this listed as a compatible replacement for the 2N56, what is it, the 2N5632. So luckily these transistors are a lot cheaper nowadays than they were back in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, and I was able to pick up 10 of them, 10 lightly used ones, for around 18 bucks. Versus going to like a part supply shop, I was able to get these for $8 a piece with $10 shipping and handling. So hey, I rolled the dice on used ones. So I'm going to test one of these out, make sure it's good, swap it out with here, and then I'll meet you guys back at the cabinet while we try to see if it works. Alright, so I got the CRT chassis reinstalled, um, the ground cable hooked up. It must have been an original plate or something that this connected to that's missing. So I just ran an additional ground wire to the metal casing of the CRT and hooked that to the, uh, the ground of the chassis itself. I've got the base of the CRT plugged back in and all these corresponding wires connected to the yoke. There's little dots around the yoke to show you um, which connector which colored wire goes to. 
Um, so I haven't tested this yet. We're doing this live on camera. Let's see if we've got some tube glue. All right, the base of our tube is glowing. All right, now we're onto the tube. Oh no, I got complete collapse on one of these axes. All right, I'm gonna power this down really quick before I burn something into the tube. Okay, so from what we saw on the tube, uh, it's pretty obvious we have no vertical deflection. So I kind of combed through this board a little bit. I checked the uh, PNP and NPN uh, transistor uh, that are responsible for that uh, vertical deflection. Followed all the wires up to the yoke and I found that the vertical side was open. So if I played with it right here just a little bit by like flexing on the board, I can get it to show like 200 and something ohms on the meter while the other side, uh, you know, was perfect. Thinking that maybe I had a break there so what I did is I cut a little shielding off. I'm gonna scrape that, re-solder, and then um, see if we, uh, if we can get some better connection. All right, now that we got that wired repaired, um, we're getting this 256 ohms across these two top coils here. Uh, I'm assuming are the vertical coils. That seems like a problem, especially when we compare it to the lower coils and we're only reading it like, let that stabilize out. I don't know, 1.7 ohms, 1.6 ohms. Uh, so the difference between 1.6 and 256 is obviously substantial. Uh, so I figure it should be easy to narrow down uh, if there's a problem in one side of the coil versus the other because uh, of the way they're wired up. So for example, let's see here. If we follow this wire around, it goes into the top part of this coil, exits from this tiny wire, and kind of comes to the center tap. Same thing with this coil. This lead right here cycles up into the top, and then this wire comes out of the bottom and right back to this kind of center tap. So if I measure from here to here and here to here, I should be able to see the resistance of each side of the coil and identify where the problem is. Okay, exactly half of 256 ohms. That's not what I'm expecting. Let's check the other side. Hundred and twenty-eight ohms. So if there was a problem, I would expect to see more resistance on the coil with an issue. Having the, uh, the fact that uh, both sides kind of have symmetrical resistance kind of rules out an issue. I mean, what's the chances that there's two, two issues at the exact same time causing in the same amount of resistance? Probably not high. But there's no resistors in here. I'm not sure where that resistance is coming from and 256 ohms uh, is pretty clear indication of a problem. So I turned to Reddit, uh, there's an arcade section on there, and kind of posted a lengthy description of my issue, and had a couple people agree that yeah, uh, the yoke is toast, but with symmetrical resistances, I, I don't see a burnout being uh, a likely problem here. Uh, so head scratcher for sure. All right, so I didn't want to overthink this too much. Uh, we found that open in the vertical coil and uh, got that repaired. So I figured, hey, let's just throw it on the tube and see where we're at. And you can see we're only getting, you know, three quarters of a rolling um, image here. So I'm thinking the problem's still in that yoke, something to do with that resistance. Now, some of you savvy viewers may have noticed that the orientation of the pictures changed uh, from the last time we had the cabinet on. It turns out I had the yoke aimed wrong. Um, so another step in the right direction, but still not having a clear picture. All right, well, let's bring it back to the bench and see what our options are. All right, so I've spent a, a fair amount of time online uh, looking stuff up about this yoke, uh, you know, trying my luck again at replacements. 
um, you know, post into some forums, and yeah, there's just not a lot out there for this specifically. So, as luck would have it, one of my buddies has a uh, Space Invaders cocktail game using the same Wells Gardner monitor. Uh, so he was kind enough to uh, take some measurements for me of his horizontal and vertical. Um, so our horizontal is pretty close to being in spec, <clears throat> but his vertical is like 200 ohms less than mine. So, and his monitor works. So beyond a shadow of a doubt, problems in, uh, in the vertical. So what are my options at this point? I kind of just thought about the idea of like, hey, maybe wiring it up in parallel um, to bring that resistance down. But, you know, there's still a problem in there. So that makes no sense. That and, you know, the manual itself shows it wired in series. You know, I could post a want ad on uh, KLOV to see if anybody's got one. Uh, we can just say nuts to it and replace the uh, tube and chassis all together. Or we can try something fun. You know, let's, um, I'm thinking, let's take apart this, the vertical side here and um, rewind it, right? So I don't know what the inductance is supposed to be, um, but what I can do is count the number of turns that come off this coil and put that, you know, that many or a little bit more back on, measure some things out and adjust as needed. Now I got this 24 mag here, um, but it's a little bit thicker and I don't want to add more resistance trying to get the inductance I need. Um, so, I measured this out with a micrometer on a little bit of exposed magnet wire right here. And it came out to about like 0 0.19, 0 0.20 millimeter. And there's a chart online that you can, um, you know, find what gauge is based off a millimeter. And that's uh, roughly about 32 gauge. So, I think I'll buy a spool of like a uh, half pound spool of that 32. Um, and then rewind this and see what we can do with it. You know, what's the worst that happens? It doesn't work still. Uh, but that's going to be for another video. Uh, so thank you guys very much for watching. Hopefully we have uh, a little bit better luck next time.